of it because they might go all the way. Or two two bow. Ten two bow. We're in chapter 14. By the way, we're not right now in a, in, a, in a section or the message we're preaching tonight isn't necessarily chronological in the sense that uh, we have been introduced now to Israel, to Jacob's trouble. And we've seen this woman who was to bear the uh, Christ child. And we've seen that he was caught up into heaven. And now we're seeing the persecution God's people, national Israel. So this evening, uh, you you may say, well, Pastor, you know what about what about uh, the dragon and the beast? We haven't been introduced to them yet. Well, we'll touch on them a little bit this evening. We were introduced to the dragon, but uh, this evening I just want to look at a couple of just a, an important uh, truth and the theme that we find in Revelation. And uh, I've got a nap getting me here. Okay. Let's just begin in verse 1 of Revelation 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the sound the voice of a great thunder. And I heard of the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Okay, that would make a great song, wouldn't it? The voice of harpers harping with their harps. <coughs> And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Uh, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb with whosoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. There followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. Let's read verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Our Father, I pray for your help this evening as we look at Scripture for discernment and understanding to know, Lord, what we can know, and to understand the God that we worship as a result of what you, well, may be known of you from your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in that portion of time, that period of time now where God has introduced us to Israel and we are seeing uh, the nations of the world about to, uh, to, have, to be destroyed by the God of Israel. These 144,000 we've been introduced to previously, uh, if you go back to Revelation chapter 7, um, we see this, these individuals who have the mark of God on their foreheads. Verse 3 of Revelation 7, if you've turned back there. Um, saying, this is the angel crying with a loud voice that could hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed, and hundred and forty and four thousand, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Okay. Uh, the scripture is very, very clear about who the 144,000 are that are sealed by God. Who are they? Jews. Yeah, they're Jews. They're the tribes of Israel. They're Israelites. 
And these Israelites come from each nation, Judah, Asher, Manassas, Nephthalim, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, and of Joseph, 12,000, and of Benjamin, there's 12,000. And so we see where these tribes come from. You say, Pastor, the 12 tribes today of Israel, how do we know who they are? Well, to be quite frank with you, we actually don't. Uh, the 12 tribes have lost their uh, tribal distinction, albeit not their national distinction. I do think, however, that there would be individuals who are Israelites who have a veil over their eyes, who uh, cannot see. When God removes that veil from them, perhaps there will be some of these 144,000 who currently are not even aware that they're Israel at all. Uh, I believe that for a testimony, God has preserved the national identity of the Jews. I believe God's done that so that people will know that there's a people who this is not, they're not the people who have the seal of God or the mark of God and they're for it. But there are people who have covenant promises to through whom God is going to work in the world after he's finished with his church. And at this phase, at this point in the revelation, we know that the church is no longer being involved. An individual who uh, does not believe in the uh, pre-trib rapture ignores the fact that God is working through Israel in this portion of, of Revelation. An individual who believes in the pre-trib rapture oftentimes, not always, but usually equates, I should say, if, they're, if they do their due diligence in their bad theology, they will equate the covenant promises to Israel uh, with the church. In other words, they'll mix Israel and the church. They'll make them one and the same institution and claim the promises that God has made to Israel for the church. And I would say the ones who do their due diligence in their bad theology would be, for instance, the Presbyterians. They're very careful to go ahead and go all the way. But there's a fad among Baptists even today to uh, deny the imminent coming, uh, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus to take up His saints and to uh, teach that the saints will be involved in the tribulation, that they'll be in the tribulation period. And my friend, it just, it just doesn't work with the theology of Revelation which deals with Israel. I've tried very hard to watch some of, the, some of the videos and read some of the books that are put out right now. And I don't mean to be demeaning or insulting, but the real trouble that I find with it is that there is just such a gap in, in expositional theology or just in expositional uh, reading of the Scripture. In other words, they, they'll read, for instance, um, Matthew 24, 29. And that's the only verse they want to talk about in Matthew. They don't want to read you know, the questions that Jesus answered. Uh, they don't want to read Mark chapter 13. When they deal with verses from Revelation, they don't want to deal with the book of Revelation and the outline that's given in the beginning introduction of Revelation. They just want to uh, pick pieces. And uh, what they ignore is all the verses that directly address Israel. And Revelation 7 here, my friend, directly addresses Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. Who are the 12 tribes of Israel? My friend, God knows. He's never been confused. He's never thought, I wonder who the 12 tribes are. Do you remember Benjamin? Do you remember what happened with Benjamin when uh, Benjamin really committed just terrible, wicked sins and was almost wiped out as a result of it? What was the plan that God allowed for Benjamin to remain a tribe and to, to keep propagating? Charlie knows about this because he's always thought about doing it. Uh, so, Charlie, what was the plan? Seven brides for seven brothers. Seven brides for seven brothers. <laughs> In other words, some of the other tribes would hold like this uh, ladies get together this dance and, and they wouldn't be watching closely and the Benjamites would be allowed to come and just steal wives uh, from the virgins that were dancing there. And then also they went and conquered some of the enemies, some of the other tribes and, and took the women and Jabesh gave them to the Benjamites. What's that? Was that Jabesh Gilead? Was it Jabesh Gilead? Uh, it yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. That's almost a Joel question. Like where in Missouri was Pastor Ryan Price. You're just like veering off on a tangent that I don't want to go down. I'm only teasing you. I was only teasing Joel too. It's just funny. Okay, so uh, the um, seven brides for seven husbands. <laughs> the Benjamites were propagated because they married other tribes of Israel 
and even women from other nations, and yet they were Benjamites. That was the tribe of Benjamin. And so that was the tribe that they became part of by marrying into it. And today God has got a record of that. There is nothing to what the rabbis have made a rule that uh, the Jewishness is passed down through the mother. And that's, there's nowhere in the scripture anywhere. And it's fairly decently recent. That is in the last, I'm trying, I can't remember now. I, I knew someone that told me one time, or I read it somewhere, how long that they have been making that a rule. Uh, that you're still you're Jewish on the basis of the mother, not the father, because a lot of Jewish women marry uh, Catholic men or Christian men or whatever, and so they say, well, you know, it's the Jewish mother that Judaism goes through. God has no such rule, and gave no permission for the Jews to make rules. God knows who the uh, tribe of Judah is, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, Nephilim and Asher and Gad and so on and so forth. He knows who they all are. And he's going to, the, the veil, the cloud, is going to be removed from their eyes. And they're going to be seeing what John is here having the privilege of seeing. It's, they're going to be seeing the throne in heaven where God is. They're going to know who God is. And those who receive him are going to be sealed, marked with a seal on their foreheads. And so we're introduced to that 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. And we actually looked at this some weeks past. But it's important to... Uh, to uh, venture to to look at um, to to look at who these individuals are, and I want to just point out something as well. A lot of Christians get really hung up in this whole mark of the beast thing, don't they? I mean, <laughs> since I uh, my advent was shortly after the uh, coming of the credit card, and uh, when did when did they get the first credit cards. What was the first year that they had credit cards? Would have been in this. Would it be 60s? Yeah, probably. 1960s? It, it and, the and when they came up with the barcode, I mean, the barcode was like the mark of the beast. Uh, I remember Daniel worked with. The, remember the guy you worked with that had a barcode on his neck, and I think it was 666 was the barcode. Social security number. Was it social security number? Okay. Whatever it was, I remember saying, "Ah, oh, it's a 666 mark that you've got on you." And uh, uh, he was—I I don't remember him very well, but I just remember he had a barcode on his neck, which just made kind of an impression, especially back in the 1990s. You know, it wasn't usual. Uh, a lot of people make a lot out of the mark of the beast, and whether it's in the hand or whether it's in the forehead. I remember when they started putting, you know, little rice-sized chips in people identifiers, so that uh, and they do it for dogs. Uh, so that if you lose your dog and they scan your dog, they can find out who his owner is. Don't let them put one of those in your dog. Not because you're afraid your dog will become a beast. He's already a beast. But uh, because if you know they want to prosecute you for something your dog did, they're going to be able to trace you. So don't do that. Don't let them trace your dog. If he, he does what he does, you just leave him and go. Uh, that's my personal advice, but if you want to put a chip in your dog, that's up to you. My point on being on all this is that I'll be quite frank with you. I rather take I take rather lightly uh, this matter of the mark of the beast as far as a Christian. Because I know Christians saying, "Oh, don't get this. Don't let them chip. Don't let them do this. That's the mark of the beast." No, it isn't the mark of the beast. Because what we see here is that the mark of the beast happens as a result of those individuals who look to God or those who rebel against God. In other words, uh, look at the description in uh, chapter fourteen. And verse 1. The Bible says, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's names written in their foreheads. Okay, so these are the same ones who are described, are they not? Uh, in the same ones who are described in chapter 7? Who are they? Nationally, who are they? Israel. Israel, the Jews, right? Okay, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, <laughs> they're they're not whatever individuals want to interpret them as. We're told in Revelation who they are. You know, I, I hate to say it, but someone who makes them anything else didn't read chapter seven. They just read chapter fourteen and sniped verses, pulled verses from their context and put them with another context, which is where most of the bad theology comes from. It doesn't come from reading chapter 1 and preaching all the way through it. It comes from grabbing sections of the Bible and meshing it with other sections of the Bible. And that's where bad uh, prophecy and bad theology uh, find their source. 
person can really confuse you because they read scripture and then they say this is what it means and they take another scripture and use it to prove that that's what it means. The problem is, is that those scriptures were divorced from their context. And boy, you can sure do some strange things when you take scripture out of its context. Now, moving on. By the way, <laughs> this is really funny, but I've been getting emails from a, from a, a fellow and uh, he's been watching some of this, uh, some of our series. I don't know who he is. And um, he uses ad hominem attacks. In other words, he doesn't talk about what you say, but he, he pulls little portions out of uh, messages and then you know, starts attacks. And he said something about me flashing some sign of Satan or something with my hands, you know, doing some. I'm sorry, I don't know what those signs are, and I'm not doing anything subliminal when I put my hands up or whatever. Woo! These are just fingers. And <laughs> it just it kills me when you're so stupid. I, I said stupid. I'm not allowed to say that. Uh, I don't want don't, children. I they didn't hear that. Uh, it kills me when you lack the intellect to just look at what the scripture says. And you just got to come up with this ludicrous stuff like, you know, look at this. And, you know, he's being used to the devil. The other attack that was made, I, I read it. I, I really got a kick out of it. It kind of made my week, actually, was that I bet, you know, he's never led anyone to, to the Lord was the other attack. You know, anybody that believes this would not be... Well, actually, my friend, the reverse would actually be true. Uh, the reverse is either Reformed theology, which is Calvinism, or is one step from it. And uh, those are the theologies that don't preach the gospel. They're the theologies that believe that God pre-selects individuals for doom or a uh, wonderful heavenly destination. And so uh, that, those that's just for fun. So if you're that fellow... Um, you know, write in American English. I can't understand you uh, moving forward. Uh, verse 9, the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Okay, I want to look at this word receive in verse 9. The Bible says, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Is worship voluntary or is it forced? Is actual worship, is it voluntary? I appreciate the verses, the riffles used today. And it said that basically the people that make their idols are like them and everyone that worships their idols are like them. And uh, so a person who worships a beast who is a false God or a false Christ, is he doing so voluntarily or is he being forced to? It's a volunteer situation. In other words, these are individuals that can see the same thing that the 144,000 can see, and that is that there's a God in heaven who is meeting out judgment against those who have rebelled against him, against the wicked. And these are individuals who have chosen to follow the dragon and the beast. Why is it then, what is the significance of the seal of God versus the mark of God? Are you reading memes? No. No, okay. Just want to, you're smirking like you read a meme. Yeah. So, just just thinking about that. The Falcons, huh? The Falcons? Hawks? Whatever they are. Uh, <laughs> what is the difference? What distinguishes the 144,000 from those who have received the mark of the beast in their foreheads or in their hands. Yes? The name of God's in their forehead. Okay, well, the name that they put in there. So is it is it chance? Is it luck? That gets you the seal of God in your forehead? Well, it's their choice. No, it's a choice. It's a choice that determines it. Uh, there will be of those nations that rebel against God, there will be those that aren't part of the 144,000. There will be those who are national Israel who probably have the mark of the beast in their hand or on their forehead. Friend, the situation that I think we all should clearly see is that in all times, in all ages, the choice to receive Christ or the choice to rebel against Him is exactly that, a choice. It's a decision that's made. I'm not afraid of technology. I don't think that you know, inventing technology is going to aid the Antichrist. I'm not afraid of barcodes, QR codes. Uh, I'm not afraid of chips. Uh, 
I would just like a chip that you know used seven numbers in it instead of six numbers, you know, if I if I got one. But to be quite honest with you, I, I don't plan on getting a chip, and mostly it's because I don't like to have things under my skin. They get under my skin. Things do when they're under my skin. And whenever that happens, I try to remove them. So that would be my objection to the whole thing. I don't like tattoos. I think they're unsightly, and I think they're far too trendy. I'm not into trends very much, except for this um, antiquated uh, houndstooth jacket, which was a trend back in, what, in the 1960s or so, maybe 50s. That's a trend I'm into just about a couple of years before I was born, anyway. So my point is this. People with tattoos look trendy, and I don't like that. Um, the Getting a chip under your skin, the, the thing that would irritate me about that is the same thing that irritates me about all technology. As soon as I get mine, they come out with something better. And so, <laughs> I mean, who would want a rice-sized chip when you could get maybe a mustard seed-sized chip a month later? You know, you look at uh, the development of SD cards and so forth. And so uh, that's a um, rather small pill to swallow, I suppose. But if it were a pill that you swallowed that put the chip in you, perhaps I'd go that route. My point being this. We as Christians get so ridiculous about things that have nothing to do with anything. The mode and manner of technology is unimportant here. But the heart... To have the seal of God on your forehead or the mark of the beast on your forehead is everything. It's everything. And those are choices. And the question today is, do the things that you see, does the judgment of God lead you to repentance? Does the goodness of God lead you to repentance? Or does the judgment and the goodness of God, do they cause in you that which makes the rebels back arch up and bow up and say, no God, I'd rather bow to a fake God than bow to you. It is astonishing actually, isn't it, that the religion that man will resort to as an alternative to worshiping God. It's amazing. I love the verse the Riffles quoted this evening. I didn't quite get it down. Uh, I haven't memorized that passage of Scripture. There's a great passage of Scripture about describing idols. They have eyes that can't see. They have ears which cannot hear. They have mouths which cannot speak. They have throats that cannot make sound. They have hands which cannot handle. They have feet which cannot walk. They're like the people that made them. In other words, people made them are ugly and so are they. And uh, the people that worship them are just the same. I think it said something about ugly in it, didn't it? I'm being very not nice tonight. That, that hawk's winning or Falcons or whichever one it is, really getting under my skin. I'm hoping Tom Brady does something about it. Anyway, that's it for the message this evening, my friend. The choice is up to you. The seal of God or the mark of the beast. It's not something to be afraid of. It's a choice that you and I make. We won't be there when God deals with Israel in this way, uh, but we do have the opportunity today to make a choice of accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ. And all men are faced with the same decision. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. I ask you to help the truth to sink into our hearts in a practical way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.